Hello everyone, my name is Rosemary Milsom and I'm the director of the Newcastle Writers Festival. Thanks so much for joining us for this online venture. Uh, we can't be in person yet. Hopefully those days are ahead of us, uh, fingers crossed. Um, this has been a bit of a comedy of errors on, uh, on my part and also the lovely Anna Mears's part. We were meant to uh, catch up last week and um, as you can see, Anna's pushing her newborn baby, Evelyn, uh, rocking her to sleep. Last week, she slept through our scheduled time, as any new mum can relate to. When that baby sleeps, so do you. And, uh, and then I had a mix up uh, just at the beginning of our conversation today and uh, hadn't pushed record properly. So <laughs> look, I think um, we're finally, finally getting together and having this uh, conversation I've really looked forward to. We're going to be talking about Anna Mears, uh, new book now. And um, I don't know how she found the time, but luckily most of the book was done before Tiny Evelyn arrived in February. But um, Anna is one of our most successful athletes. Uh, she's the uh, Australian, only first Australian woman to win gold, Olympic gold on the cycling track. And the only Australian athlete to win gold medal uh, medals at four Olympic Games. Gold medals, Anna? Or yeah, just four consecutive individuals. Yeah, yeah, at um, at four Olympics, which is quite extraordinary, but throw in Commonwealth Games gold medals and world championships, and uh, you get the picture. She's an extraordinary athlete. And I reckon most of us uh, kind of got to know Anna in a more significant way when she injured a vertebra in her neck. If you cast your mind back, it happened in LA and it was in the lead up to the 2008 Olympics and um, in Beijing. Now, a lot of people had wrote her off after that, but um, seven months later, there she was on the podium collecting a medal and uh, quite an extraordinary achievement. And I reckon she kind of touched all of our hearts at that point. We saw the determination and um, you know commitment to her sport to get back on the track uh, with that injury and there's a, there's an image in the book that's quite um, amusing I'm not laughing at your injury Anna but there's an image in the book of you on your bike set up on a stationary bike um, to start your training very kind of delicately and you know those uh, you see them in Ikea those kind of clothes racks that you wind up and she's got one of those in front of her to help her balance that's that's what they could find to help her kind of manip manipulate the height uh, so yeah, I mean, look, that's part of the this book, that account of um, of getting back on track for those Olympics. But there's plenty of other dramatic highs and lows, and um, and I'm really looking forward to speaking to you. Thank you, Anna. After <laughs> after all of this, <laughs> and uh, congratulations again on the birth of uh, baby Evelyn. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's a a wonderful thing. I must admit, I've been able to achieve some pretty amazing things and win a lot of titles in my time but being a mum and having Evelyn in my life is by far the best. I suppose when you think about it and you write about this in the book there was a, a period where you didn't think you may become a mum. No um, obviously age becomes a factor physical uh, toll takes a factor as well I'd spent 22 years as an athlete uh, I retired as a single person after going through divorce um, after nine years of marriage and, um, you know, all of those elements and probably a bit of a hit on my self-esteem and self-confidence. Um, I felt that maybe all the things were starting to align that I wouldn't be able to experience being a mum. So um, when Evelyn came along, it was just the most amazing emotional experience to have that reality hit. Does anything you've ever done on the track uh, compare to being pregnant and giving birth? And, and even, I suppose, that initial period afterwards when you're so exhausted. I mean, you would know exhaustion, that physical exhaustion, but uh, does it compare at all? I know physical exhaustion and I also know elation that can override that at the end. Um, never have it, has it happened at the magnitude of after Evelyn was born. Um, how I got through her delivery was obviously understanding or well, not knowing, but the Valsalva technique, um, which we utilize often in the gym, holding our breath, be able to lift big weights. And I remember just before we had to push, um, my partner, Nick and I were having a, a slight debate over me not knowing the term of what that's called. So, um, it was quite entertaining for our obstetrician, let me tell you. <laughs> well, congratulations. And I suppose what a, uh, Interesting time to have a baby. I, I have been thinking of new mums actually during this period and that isolation. I mean, it tends to make you isolated anyway when you've got a newborn.
but there's those lovely moments when friends and family drop in and they might take the baby for a little while and you can go have a rest or a shower or a bath. But um, how has it been for you during this period of isolation? Um, in some ways, it's been a blessing in disguise because, uh, like you said, with a newborn, you don't get out too often. Um, but my partner, Nick, has been able to work from home as a result of COVID-19 and, and see every element of her growing in the first you know, three to four months of her life, which he would otherwise not have seen. So that's been really lovely to have it all to ourselves. Um, on the other side, having it all to ourselves and the restrictions means that uh, we don't have visitors to our home. Um, many of our family members live interstate and into country, so they haven't even met her yet. A lot of flights for those experiences had to be cancelled. Um, I haven't been able to attend mum's groups or get to know people um, with a newborn baby. So I've really relied on my friends who have had children, even my sister Tracy, um, because otherwise I don't have any uh, access to those. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword in some ways, but uh, I'm certainly not complaining. Mm. You would be used to, I mean, given your career and, um, and I mean, you talk in the book about uh, the psychological kind of um, tactics and mechanisms that are put in place to support you as an elite athlete. Uh, and I, I wonder if, you know, you, you've carried on, even though you retired in 2016, I wonder if you've carried on some of those strategies even beyond retirement and now into this period of your life. Oh, absolutely. Um, one of the things that I've, I've re realised is that sport has taught me a lot. Uh, and I think that's why when I do speaking engagements, I'm able to correlate to people some of those lessons from a sporting environment that it's applicable in really any other environment of life. Um, not just winning and losing, but dealing with pressure and expectation, dealing with adversity, change, how to be resilient, what resilience is, fatigue. There's so many, so many topics um, that are prevalent. Um, but psychologically, it's a really big one. You know, athletes are very well known for their physical strength and we have coaches and we tap into them to be able to help them be at our physical best. But Athletes really also tap into psychological coaches in, in being able to upskill themselves to mentally handle or drive the body to be successful. And um, I've been open-minded to, to all of those and I have great psychological and physical coaches that have taught me so much that does help me even you know, with my, my newborn daughter. Mm. Um, that being said, <laughs> being the self-critic and the analytical person that I am, um, I also need to learn how to bring that down a little bit, you know, because the heightened environment of an Olympic Games or a sporting in industry, you know, in the high performance domain, um, it really is very, very pointy and stuff. And it doesn't have to be always at that level of intensity. The thing that struck me, strikes me about the book too is, um, well, you know, while you're an individual athlete and you're competing as an individual, um, at one point, I can't remember which event you win. It's a, a significant win, a victory. And you thank in the book all the people that are in your team, so to speak. And, and that team isn't um, they're, they're the, the professionals that are, that are hired to sort of, you know, maintain your well-being, your performance. And the list goes on and on. You thank every person. And it suddenly occurred to me reading that, that... Um, you know, I think there's something very unique about individual sport. I mean, team sport's a whole other kettle of fish. If you lose, you win. You can kind of, um, the focus dissipates unless you do something horrendous and miss the goal at the, you know, right on the, on the buzzer or, you know, I'm not saying that individuals aren't singled out. But it strikes me that, that as an individual athlete, um, there's a lot riding on you. There's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of expectation and... I wonder if, you know, you've had to deal with um, the victories and the losses very differently to a team athlete. Uh, team athlete, I've never really been involved with. So I can't give you a mm. comparative, but I can give you from my perspective. Um, individual athletes are very much seen in a selfish light because they do it for themselves. Um, but even though I'm an individual athlete, I, like you said, I'm very much part of a large team. And even though... I may get the results and I may win the medal and my name might appear in the headlines as a result of that. There are many people involved with those wins whose names you won't know because they're not winning the medals and they're not in the headlines. Um, it takes a big team of people for one person to be successful. 
And you have to have a huge element of trust in that team. Everyone has to know what their role is, what their contribute, their ability to contribute to the goal is. And it's a lot like a wheel, you know, excuse the pun, but every member of that wheel is, is a spoke. And if a spoke breaks, uh, the wheel starts to buckle and the load spreads to every other member of, of that team. And it will still function because everyone picks up the load until it becomes too much for someone else and another spoke breaks and another spoke breaks and eventually the wheel buckles beyond recognition and doesn't function well. I had to really trust people in expert professional roles in my team because I can't be an expert at all those fields for me to be an expert and successful in my role. And so who you choose to be a part of your team is really, really important. Um, where I felt the pressure for those people was that they gave me all the information and all of the skills required for me to be successful. And at the end of the day, they let me go to execute mm. those strategies and those plans. And if I fail, the team fails. Um, I get goosebumps thinking about it, you know? So I never blamed anyone when I lost. I wore defeat very, very heavily because I understood that element of what I did. Um, look, Likewise, when I won, I was always very thankful for the amount of people and who helped me be successful. Yeah, I mean, the other thing that um, occurred to me when reading the book too is, in a way, you shed light on um, how to cope with the losses. And, you know, you you have some losses. It's not all kind of, you know, gold, river, rivers of gold. Um, there are some significant losses. And... I suddenly realised, you know what, it's actually the, the, the strength of an athlete is dealing with the losses. Just, you know, obviously the wins are great and you get that incredible high and, and I'm sure that does also create uh, a set of issues. And, you know, you've got to kind of come back down to reality and get training again and refocus for the next four years or however long it is, your, you know, your plan is. Uh, but it's how you process those losses and don't let them completely destroy your um, your psychological game, your strategy, and particularly because you talk a lot about the long-term strategy of, of how you compete. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I think that, I don't know, I suddenly saw everything in a different light. I thought it's, um, it's yes, we all look at you when you're standing there getting that medal, but it's when you're crying, when you walk off after a loss and you're, you're devastated, um, but you manage to come back from that that they're the moments we don't see as the public. In actual fact, that's your real strength, I think. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, when I wrote this book, I wanted to be able to be really honest in sharing some of those low points. And like, I'm an emotional character, I feel, and I respond um, in the same way. And I have won 11 world titles in my career, and that makes me equally the most successful woman in the world at my discipline. Now that means no one has won more than I have. But what many people don't know is I've actually lost more than I have won. Mm. Uh, and it's been because of those losses that I've sat there, I've analyzed, I've felt them. I've never wanted to be there again. I've wanted to progress from them to work out how to continually be successful over a long period of time. And you have to understand in order to be resilient and face adversity, loss, change, challenge, whatever the case may be, you have to accept you're not always going to win. And sometimes the perception I think of the public is because you don't, you don't tune in to us day in, day out. Um, and many sports in the Olympic world, really people only tune in every four years. So you don't see the points in between or the moments in between. And uh, it really takes a lot of battling, a lot of fighting um, to make successful moments happen. And that's why it's really important to celebrate those wins too when they do come, because they're actually really rare. Yeah, I know. It's all, all that much sweeter, isn't it? Can you take us back then to, uh, I suppose, the most, one of the most significant challenges you faced as an athlete when you did injure yourself in Los Angeles and it was leading up to the Beijing Olympics. And obviously, you, you know, you were focused and strategy and and had been put in place and all the years leading up to that period uh and you're seven months out and you fall and um it's quite chaotic afterwards you're in hospital in america and that in itself has its own challenges can you tell us about um you know deciding that this was not going to hold you back like you know did you um 
was it just stubbornness? Or? No. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, stubbornness and perhaps a little naivety as well with youth. Um, it's one thing to be told you've broken your neck. Comprehending that is completely different because um, internally you can't, you can't see those injuries. Um, and I felt pretty okay. Like all things considered, I had a hell of a headache. I was sore. I was stiff, but it wasn't anything different from other falls or impacts that I had had in my career initially. And, mm -hmm. And I was so driven and I was so desperate in some ways to re-experience the Olympic Games, which I had my first in Athens in 2004 as a young 20-year-old. Um, I really, really wanted to be there again. And when I had my fall and when I learned that I'd had um, broken my neck at the C2 level, which is the second down from the skull, um, I was devastated um, thinking that my dream had gone out the window. And being that analytical person, mm -hmm. when the doctor came in and said, you'll need to be in a neck brace for 10 weeks, I just went to math. And I'm like, I'm set, I've got seven months to the games, 10 weeks in a brace. That leaves me at least four and a half months to get into some sort of condition. Should I have done enough prior to my fall for a qualification spot? Now, what most people don't realize is in our sport, it's a two-year qualification period for the Olympic Games. Uh, so you may actually qualify the spot doesn't mean you fill it. It's very different to swimming where it's a one-off um, trial for selection. Um, and so that was uh, one battle in itself was just making the team, but really getting back on the bike was, was another one. Um, because when I realized the severity of my injury, I was struck by, by fear. I, I really was struck by fear. And that fear had me questioning if it was worth continuing in sport because life all of a sudden had a very different um, meaning. And with this fear of the what if, you know, if that two millimeters hadn't have been there, I went to my coach and I said, look, I don't know if I want to ride anymore. I'm scared to get back on onto the track. And um, you know, what if, what if I had have broken my neck further, I wouldn't be here even to experience life further. So, you know, he was very empathetic and understanding. And he said, look, just, you're asking the right questions. You maybe just got one word in there wrong. Don't ask yourself what if of a situation, ask yourself what is. And the simple difference of, of looking at the same uh, situation from a completely different perspective is one is fear and emotionally driven. And the other is simple, tangible reality of information to deal with. And I went from fearing two millimeters to being thankful for two millimeters. And I completely changed my outlook through the rehabilitation that followed in the following seven months of that fall. And having learned that and a number of other things um, in that time frame, not only did I change as a person in terms of the growth and understanding my capacity, what strengths and weaknesses I had, but the athlete I became was far more than I ever had been because I all of a sudden had a completely different approach to and gratitude for what I was doing. It's interesting because that part of the book where you mentioned that, that was Marv Barris, your coach at the time, who says yeah. that to you. I, I underlined um, because I thought, that's so interesting, isn't it? We, I mean, you hear all the time, don't focus on the future. Well, only focus on what you can control. And da, 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 da. But it really struck me very simply. What if? What is? Yeah. I, I just, it's such a great little kind of um, way to, as you said, reshape how you see a situation. It, I thought it was superb. It's not rocket science. Nothing that's in that book is rocket science. I think what it, what it is, is it's just been simplified to be understood. You know, contingency planning, what if is great because you've got to have options for potential, um, you know, things that could happen in the future. But situational response to particular moments where emotion can cloud your ability to see information clearly and make the right decisions, that's where the what if versus what is is really, really profound and powerful. Because we spend so much of our time focusing on the narrow pieces of the puzzle to get them perfect to fit into the big picture that often we forget to look at the big picture. Mm. And, uh, and as an athlete, we're very good at focusing on the narrow things and we need great coaches um, or teachers around us to be able to give us that perspective of the big picture when necessary. When you were facing um, competition in Beijing, had you entertained the idea that you might not be victorious? Had you, had you thought, look, you've, <laughs> you're back on the bike, you've put the hard yards in, but you, you know, you just may not get victory in the end. Had you prepared yourself for that? 
No, I honestly believed I was capable. And, and that's, from an athlete's perspective, that is the holy grail, you know? So you, you aim for that all the time. There are times where you've got to be realistic about your goals and what you can achieve. Um, but I was really bullish at that time. I was really hard nosed about the, my capability um, and my desire to be there because I had already been there. Uh, I'd won gold in Athens in a world record time for the 500 time trial. Um, now history shows I ended up winning silver and I got completely thrashed by my rival Victoria Pendleton in the final. And I remember crossing the line disappointed, you know, cause you have to lose in order to win a, a silver medal in our, in our event. And it took me a little while to realize it wasn't really the disappointment I was feeling. It was, it was just sheer relief. I had spent so much time, you know, going hard at that goal that uh, when I finally crossed the finish line, I could take a breath. Can we talk about Victoria Pembleton? Because um, there's, you know, the, I mean, obviously the media played it up at the time. And, and I think everyday Australians were very aware of this kind of, you know, dynamic of these enemies, these sworn enemies, um, British writer, obviously, Victoria Pembleton. And, um, and in the book, um, as you're preparing for, we'll skip ahead to the London Olympics, and you write about the um, Know Thy Enemy preparation, which was um, incredible. I found, see, I love all this nitty gritty stuff around sport and strategy. So I. <laughs> and I just find, I find it really compelling. Um, but it was a campaign. It was a, um, a strategy on, the part, on, the half, on behalf of your team, on the part of your team, I should say, to prepare for London and victory over Victoria Pembleton. And, um, you know, there's just incredible dedication to knowing who she is, how she performs, what her strategies are. And this was all happening while you could focus on your training. Uh, you know, members of your team took this on as well. It wasn't just you sitting there watching videos of, you know, recordings of her races. Um, this was a team effort. Uh, and it is quite extraordinary. It's simply known as the KTE, like know, know thy enemy. Um, and I wondered if... Uh, having an enemy or having, um, not even if it's an individual, obviously you're an individual sport, but you know, teams have it like the arch enemies. And whenever yeah, they come up against muscle. each other, it's like, it all just ramps up. How important is it to actually have an enemy? I mean, Victoria Pendleton, would, would you say in the book, you know, you might not have been the athlete you were without her. Um, how important is that? Uh, for me, it was very important. Um, and I can say that now at the time, I probably wouldn't have said that because it was so stressful <laughs> mm. having a rival of her caliber. Um, and the reason such dedication came into uh, the project for London called Know the Eye Enemy um, was simply because we knew that she was the one to beat. Um, she was the best in the world. She'd been undefeated internationally for six years. No one had worked out how to beat her. And Know Thy Enemy isn't actually about knowing your opponent. It's about knowing yourself through understanding who it is you're competing against. So the first step was to understand Victoria. And we did a lot of analysis. My team did a lot of analysis on Victoria to give me basic information strategically broken down into data because what data does is it takes away emotion and the emotion of that rivalry that came with Vicky Pendleton was so profound that I almost couldn't focus on the strategies to try and beat her. So by giving me basic information, we, we took that out. We didn't, I didn't have to deal with that anymore. And once I had the information clear in front of me without emotion, I could start to understand how to implement it into a strategy to defeat her by understanding then how I had to improve, what my weaknesses were and what my strengths were. And that's the part of this sport that I love and have always loved um, and why I stayed with it so long because everyone brings a different strengths and weaknesses, set of strengths and weaknesses and you have to spend the time to understand them. And every cycle, it changes because you get new rivals, new competitors, new coaches come in. Um, and so you have to constantly analyze and reanalyze to not just stay in the competition, but to be competitive within it. And so once I understood Vicky, I learned most about my weaknesses. And then we spent a lot of time dealing 
or improving my skills in order to be able to execute what we felt was going to be the best strategy in London. Now that's a three to four year process. Um, and that's on, you know, that's me just focusing on my job of training and the team doing their job in the early stages and then teaching me um, how to be better in the end. And then I think what, what um, I took on board too was that's all fine, but then you've got to face the noise, the cheering. When you walk into that velodrome at the London Olympics with the sort of hometown hero and she's, you know, you've got to beat her and the noise of that and because it is, it's so condensed, it's um, heightened. And it was interesting that someone suggested because John Eels was, um, was with the team as a support person uh, with the Australian team. And someone suggested you go and speak with him because obviously, you know, they've had to face off against the New Zealand, the All Blacks and the Harker, which is the most intimidating um, way to kind of start a competition. Um, and yeah, he, 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 he gave you a little bit of a tip, didn't he, about how to deal with that aspect of that, uh, the, the competition. Yeah, he did, you know. Really, he shared with me how they were able to remain in control of their own uh, lead into the game despite the hucker. Um, and that was, in a nutshell, walking out on the field in their tracksuit because it gave them time to walk off the field, get undressed from the tracksuit, gather into a huddle and give him the chance as leader to be able to talk to his team before they stepped into competition. Whereas previous to that, they were just going straight into the game and get mowed over by the Kiwis. So we kind of took that and thought, well, we're going into a hostile environment against the British crowd, against the hometown favourite. Um, and not just the hometown favourite, like Victoria was the face of the, the British team. And, and so we thought, you know what, let's, let's put her out there first. Let the crowd give her the adulation and I'll sit back with my team, simply going over the dot points of the strategy, what I need to do and wait for the crowd to stop. Uh, and, and you could pick it. It didn't take long. Uh, the crowd cheered her. And then all of a sudden they were like, okay, well, where, where's Anna, you know? And then the focus went off of Victoria and I was no, not overwhelmed by a hostile environment by the time I got to the start line. Um, and simple things like that made such a big difference on the day because that environment was, oh, I never, ever want to feel it again. <laughs> <laughs> It's, uh, I think it's something the rest of us only ever have nightmares about. Yeah. You know, being in a situation where everyone, you know, you, 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 you know, you've, you've got to perform and everyone's looking at you. It's that, it's the stuff of nightmares. Um, and we haven't, we, we haven't got careers and all the training and, uh, and um, commitment riding on that. But um, I don't know if you've had a chance because obviously you've, you've got a baby, but if you've been able to watch um, the um, Michael Jordan documentary on Netflix, mm -hmm. The Last Dance, Yes, which, I have is, been, which has been incredible. And um, there's a, one of the episodes, it, it finished um, recently, but one of the episodes in it, um, you know, and he's such, he comes across as such a domineering, um, uh, committed character, like really sort of ruthless. And, um, and he said at one point, um, winning has a price and leadership has a price. Yeah, that stood out for me too. And I thought of you because I was reading your book at that time when I was sort of watching that episode. Um, and, yeah, I thought of you and I wondered um, if you could talk a little bit about the price, the price you do pay for winning, the price you do pay for being a leader because you were a leader. You were a leader within cycling um, and then, you know, you're a leader as, a, as an experienced athlete when you went off to future Olympic Games uh, and then obviously the most, you know, proud moment when you carried in the flag at your last Olympics in Rio in 2016. That, that's indicative of you being seen as a leader. So could you talk just a little bit about that, the price you pay? Yeah, well, it's, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because um, I remember I was talking with my coach, Gary West, about this. Um, at one point, I, said, I asked him, um, do you think I'd be a good coach? And he said, yeah, you'd be a great coach. I'd mentor you too. And I said, oh, I don't know if I want a coach. And he goes, well, why is that? I said, because then I'd have to work with people like me. <laughs> and he's like, oh, well, maybe then you'll get a bit of an understanding of what you put me through in the last decade. Um, you know, because he always said to me I was the most demanding athlete he had ever worked with. Uh, but I was also the most rewarding. Um, he'd never been held to such a high standard by an athlete before me. And he enjoyed being able to be challenged in that way. 
in the end. Um, but to start with, uh, it does take a toll. Um, the expectation is one thing um, in terms of, you know, the public perception, um, winning and all that sort of stuff. But also when you are a leader, you're still a part of the team and you still have to deliver your KPIs and your performances in order for the team to be successful. However, if the team is not successful, the leader is the one that answers for it. And the leader is the one that has to stand up for how all those individuals are part of it. And so as a leader, you have very high expectations, not just for yourself, but for the people that you work with. And if you're going to dedicate and um, commit and be as focused as you are, then for me, I expected that of all the people that I worked with as well. Um, I probably didn't have the, the relationships um, that many of my teammates had with each other. Um, I didn't go out and have, you know, drinks and celebrate at the end of competitions because I knew if I was seen with alcohol, it may be put on the, on the news coverage, you know, and mm. so um, my relationships and friendships are very different with my teammates than they have with themselves. Uh, but at the same time, had I engaged in that way, I may not have had the results that I had in my career to be able to, you know, be as proud as, as I am. So that's just relationship wise, um, mentally and emotionally, it takes a huge toll um, because in some ways you become even more isolated, even though you're a part of a really big team. Um, my family didn't even know and understand the level of work and toll that it takes on the mind and the body. Um, you know, I have footage of my training after leading into London simply because they'd never seen me train. They'd seen me race, but they'd never seen me train. And then they understood why I was sore, why I was tired, why I was getting injured. Um, I lost friendships because I never went to birthday parties or often I didn't go to weddings because I was preparing for a competition. Um, I went to my niece's 16th birthday after I tired that was the first time I had attended her birthday because her birthday falls at the Olympic time. And when it's not the Olympics, I'm overseas in competition. So even on a family level, I was never present. Um, and I'm very thankful that my family have been supportive of me. And I still have that wonderful relationship with my family to go back to. That's why when I retired, it was really important to give time back to them to rebuild that in some way. Um, so yeah, the price can be pretty high. Um, that's not even covering the physical element. I know, I was going to say, you know, the list of physical um, ailments that you, you carry beyond, beyond retirement. I mean, they're with you for the rest of your life, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, very much so. Very much so. Um, you know, the biggest ones for me are obviously where I broke my neck and um, I had a very severe injury in the lower part of my spine, which, which ultimately is what called time on my career. I would have love to have gone to the Gold Coast Commonwealth Games and gone out on home soil. Um, but I just remember after the last time I injured it in 2015 in the New Zealand World Cup, I sat down with my team doctor and he said, look, you could ride on, but you probably won't walk, walk off the track. You know, That's so. that photograph in the book, isn't it, where you're strapped up, you're bandaged up, um, almost like essentially like a mummy. Yeah. yeah. All the way up your back, up, you know, like a brace, like a, a bandage brace across yeah. your whole torso. From my pelvis to my ribs, I trained strapped for the last six months of my career. Yeah. Um, you know, I needed 12 cortisone injections to get to Rio. I, I got through half of the, the course. I have a fear of needles. <laughs> um, and so after the first course, I opted to go with the strapping um, and the Nurofen and the Panadol instead because I just I, I couldn't tolerate the, the needles. Can we jump ahead to retirement? Uh, I mean, a very emotional time for you, 2016, um, Beijing, as you said, your body really kind of suffering and um, and you decide to step away. And I don't know, I suppose, you know, we like to have an image of like, you know, when racehorses retire and they go these lush pastures and life is lovely. Um, and you feel like they've earned that lovely kind of uh, bucolic bliss. But that's not what happens to you. I mean, you obviously you're competing. You're, you're so used to competing at such a, a high level, and you know, I know at one point you have uh, cocoa pops, uh, chocolate biscuits for breakfast because you can. I mean, you wake up post retirement, and I, you know, I, I thought that was such a. I just 
you know, really valued that insight that you did just let it all hang out. Every, the discipline that it takes to do what you do and that's gone. And so you just, yeah, I'm just going to have chocolate for breakfast. I'm going to lay in bed because <laughs> I can. I'm, um, but obviously the flip side of that is, um, it, you know, psychologically, psychologically that you don't have that structure in your day, that you don't have that, all those people around you and, um it seems that ultimately uh, athletes are left, you know, to their own devices to manage that post retirement phase. And I, I can't think of very many who have blossomed in that initial period. It, it, there's always a period of um, transition and, um, you know, things can go awry. And uh, and I mean, one thing you did do though, was do a kind of a, a road trip or a tour of the family and you go and catch up with all these family members, that, as you say, you weren't able to ever see, during competition, you weren't able to see regularly, but it was hard, wasn't it? Though it was, it, it was tough for you to to go through that. Very difficult. Um, and I was aware that many athletes spoke about the difficulty of transition or giving up or leaving sport. And so I had done what I thought was all the right things. Um, I'd met with the right people, career and co- uh, career and um, education coordinators. I had. Um, pathways in front of me, opportunities, great opportunities that I lost um, because I didn't know how I was going to feel when I got there. And what people don't express well to an athlete is that you will go through a sense of loss. Um, And with loss comes grief. And we all respond to grief in very different ways. That's the individual element of change and transition. Um, But for me, I had 22 years of an environment, a team, a sport, uh, a focus, a direction that I all of a sudden did not have. And, you know, you can always say, oh, just go make yourself busy, find a new direction, you know, find a new passion, all that sort of thing. There are many people in life who spend their whole life looking for one passion and don't find it. Mm. Um, so to, to in some ways be flippant with someone who has had a change of career in that way is almost you're disregarding or devaluing the loss um, of, of that experience of, of that career. And I did not realize not just one, how hard that was going to hit me, but also how hard the reality of divorce was going to hit me. I did not know how hard injury was going to hit me. And at that time I didn't realize, but got hit pretty hard with the diagnosis of my coach, Gary with motor neuron disease. So in the, in the space of you know, 12 months, I, I lost a career. I was physically injured. I had a relationship change. And uh, one of my closest um, members of my team was essentially dying. Um, and that was a lot to have to deal with. And it hit me hard. And I didn't realize how hard it was going to hit me. Um, I knew that I was struggling. I was very open to asking for help, as I have been in my whole career, understanding emotional and mental um, component of life um and i also had to learn how to just purely be kind to myself you know as as adults we're so quick to judge and critique ourselves um there's been no one who can be harsher on me than me um and the only way that i could learn to be kind to myself was you know a trip down memory lane thanks to my psychologist reader princey hubbard who just simply could see how cruel i was being to myself in this period Um, and she said, you know, if you could get dressed up in your nicest dress, do your hair and makeup and go back and knock on your childhood home door and your 11 year old self would answer the door. What do you think she would, you know, how would she feel when she saw the woman that she was going to become standing in front of her, you know, the most successful woman in the, in the world of the sport that she loved, you know, all the wonderful things that had happened in my life. And it was the first time that I kind of stopped and realized that I had not given myself an ounce of credit um, or even said thank you. And that was the first time in my mind's eye, I got down on my knees and just gave that little girl a hug um, and said thanks to her because she was gonna go through everything that I had been in order to become who I am now. And um, and it's that perspective that enabled me to, to write this book. Yeah, I think too, um, there are certain professions or careers or, or, or you know, or your identity where, um, I mean, I was a journalist for a long time and I stopped, I walked away from print journalism and 
you know, people can say oh, it's just a job and you've got other opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. But um, there are some professions that are ingrained in you in a way that they are, you know, that it isn't what you do, it is who you are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, it, it's a part of so your identity. People say it shouldn't be, you should, you know, you, there's you, then there's the job you do and you separate the two. But for some people, and myself included, when you are you find your calling, so to speak, and you're passionate about it, you give and give and give, you do the long hours. Yeah, I'll work the Sunday, whatever you want me to do. Yes, 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 yes. Um, and, it, and when you do walk away like I did, uh, you do grieve it. And it's about... Um, almost reforming a new identity. It's not just trying to find a, a hobby or, you know, um, go do some volunteer work or whatever people say, the niceties that off, they don't understand that it's actually, you've got to reconfigure how you see yourself. That's exactly right. A, a job is easy to walk away from. A career and a passion is impactful more on the person, I think, to, to, to lose. Hmm. And, um, and you're very right around, you know, recrafting identity and, and even understanding relevance, our relevance in life without that um, professional space that we're used to being involved in. And um, for me, the hardest part was trying to comprehend that at the same time as watching my sport carry on without me. Um, and that's a, a real kind of admission on my ego and my pride to be, to be as honest in that mm -hmm. way as I can. Um, because I'm really proud that I've been able to leave my sport in a position where it can continue to propel itself to be better. Um, but after the dedication and even in some ways the toll, you, you do want to be missed. <laughs> and also you've got to watch these young punks coming up behind you, you know, yeah. and you kind of feel like um, you, you think back to when you, st you know, I think back to when I started as a cadet journalist and the sort of older journalists who were, you know, gave you a few tips and mentored you. And then suddenly you find yourself in that position and, you kind of think, where did the 25 years go? How, you know, and you do, you see these young, dynamic, um, tech savvy uh, young people coming through like you did with cycling, the, you know, the, the younger cyclists kind of right behind you, ready to um, push, push, push. And you know, they're going to have their moment and, uh, and you're not going to be there for that. No, that's exactly right. And, and they'll be able to benefit from the legacy and the work that you've put in as well. You know, the younger generation that came through underneath me benefited from the coaches who had already learnt from uh, either working with me or competing against me. And so the um, change that I had to adapt to was significant over a really long period of time for that reason, because my marginal gains were going to be quite small in comparison to theirs. Um, and I was doing it with an aging body as well. So um, I feel in some ways, sorry for the women that I came in underneath, but, but at the same time, very, very thankful. Yeah. Um, and what now, obviously you're focused on motherhood. Have you, is the coaching kind of side of it enticed you at all now with some time passing? Uh, look, I, I love the technical and tactical element of coaching. And as you can tell, like I get really excited when I talk about that. Day-to-day um, -day programming and structure, not so much. So <laughs> um, at the moment for me, I'm really loving being a mum. I'm really loving, you know, painting and doing things that are completely off script to what expectation uh, of the Anamir's athlete is because I'm feeding my interest as a person and um and i haven't been able to do that for a really long time so for the moment that's that's where i'm enjoying it and you deserve you deserve a bit of time off i mean that's the other thing too you know there's value in just um taking time isn't there very much so and not having a schedule and um and, well you know your own schedule i should say yeah yeah and you set the schedule Exactly. And, and there is something to be said in doing, you know, doing nothing is actually doing something sometimes. Look, it's been really wonderful talking to you. Thank you so much. I'm finally, I'm so glad we finally got it, uh, got it together between. Um, um, sorry, I fell asleep last week. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Anna Muse's book is called Now. And if you click on the link and you will be able to, to buy this book, it's, it's really fantastic. I think it's a great book to read in the time we're in now. I think we've all had to kind of make some adjustment. I don't think anyone has escaped um, having to adjust their life in some way during, um, you know, the impact of COVID, whether it's homeschooling, uh, you know, not seeing family or loved ones and uh, working from home, that's, that's a big enough challenge for, uh, for a lot of people. So I don't know, I think there's, there's a lot of value in it. There are a lot of um, 
really strong applicable life lessons we're not i'm not going to be an elite athlete and most of us aren't ever going to get to that to the level obviously that anna has but um there's there's real value she's really honest and and look, thank you for being so honest with the book because i really did take a lot away from it oh you're very welcome thank you we um we weren't sure about whether we should release the book still um, at this time. And uh, the publisher, Jeff Armstrong, spoke with Reese Humphrey, who's the co-writer, and, and myself. And he said, look, it's too topical uh, for, for what everyone's going through at the moment. And so we just hope that if people read it, they're able to take something from it. So, Well, definitely. I, I took a lot from it. And um, yes, and it, I've got, you know, like, as everyone, I'm sort of... I'm the resident uh, book club book suggestion person. So people love, what do we read? What do we read next to a book club? And also, um, can I come and borrow that book? Now, the borrowing of books was put on put on hold for a little while because no one could come over. But um, but now I've got, uh, yes, uh, the lot, I'm sort of like the lending um, facility for a lot of friends. So this book's going to leave my house imminently and do the rounds. And, uh, and I think that, um, yeah, I think people will get a lot from it. So thank you so much. And all the best. Uh, with motherhood hopefully soon family can come and visit because I should say you're in Adelaide yes. where that's where you first went as a professional athlete and uh, and you've based yourself ever since and your family you grew up rural Queensland so you've got family a long way away but uh, hopefully it'll be all the more sweeter when they get to meet Evelyn in in the flesh for the first time it sure will she's not going to know what's hit her <laughs> no, <sure. laughs> you'll finally get a rest at that point I think indeed <laughs> take care Anna Thank you so much.